Hi there, come on in. I'm Fred Trost and I'd like you to join me for the next half hour. We have a couple great adventures way up in the North Country. We're going to start off at Pym Island on the Attawapiskat River in Northern Ontario where Carl Salling introduces us to some terrific pike fishing. My son Zach caught the pike of his life. Then we're going to head to Alaska for part two of the incredible sequence. Our five-part series on caribou hunting. We have a great recipe for venison chili, all our regular features, a lot more. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. Major funding for this program is provided by Stroh. By sharing the responsibility to preserve our natural treasures, together we ensure our right to enjoy them. Stroh, partners in preserving America's outdoor heritage. Michigan Outdoors is also underwritten by Auto Owners Insurance Company. Life, home, car, and business insurance available through your local independent auto owners agent listed in the yellow pages under insurance. Auto Owners, the no problem people. Sunrise. What a beautiful part of the day. This is fishing camp, northern Ontario, in July. At the bow of the boat, my 21-year-old son, Zach. At the motor, my 15-year-old son, Jason. And in one of the boats ahead, my dad. It was a father-son fishing trip. My favorite lure, by the way, is one my dad introduced me to in Canada when I was 10 years old, a gold Williams wobbler. I guess it's just nostalgia, but there's always been something special about the lure I used for pike and walleye fishing with my dad back in the 50s. And now on this father-son grandson trip in the 80s, I'm using the same lure, casting and trolling for pike and walleye. Carl Salling was fishing with his son Mike, who caught a nice little pike early in the week. The river we're fishing is the Attawapiskat, which flows into the Hudson Bay. We're at Pym Island, an Indian-owned camp, and Carl Salling from In Season Adventures books trips to this camp. It's the northernmost fishing camp in Ontario. It's not known for lots of fish, it's known for trophies, but we warm up on some smaller ones. Well, now that is not a bad walleye at all. Oh, I got him under the chin. A nice Canadian walleye. Well, what do you think, John? Shore um, lunch? That's it. Shore lunch, or do you think we'll catch a lot more? Yeah, well, I guess we might as well put them back. Look at the teeth on those. Now here's where a fisherman gambles on how many he's going to catch. Oh! You know, they'll sit there so nice for so long, and you can look at them, and then they go haywire. Well, we'll let them go. Now this is something I don't often do, but we're only keeping fish we're going to eat that night. The wind picks up. I switch to a spinnerbait casting next to the islands. In northern Ontario in July, okay. the weather can change on a moment's notice. You'll often have several different conditions in one day. Fine. Rain gear should be with you all the time because you'll wear it frequently. You don't want to stop fishing just because of a little shower. He's hooked right in the corner of the mouth. Remember when I tossed that walleye back? Well, it's still haunting me. Ooh now tell me I'm not living dangerously. No wire leader. But they oftentimes hook in the corner of the mouth. That's not a bad one. Not a bad one. Uh, do we need him for dinner? <laughs> do we need him for dinner, John? <laughs> we might. Now let's count on them for a few walleyes. You think we have yeah. enough walleyes? I don't know. No, he's going for dinner. I think we, I think we, we need him tonight. Yeah, we better get the stringer. I'm gonna put this one back into the water too. On the stringer. Nothing like eating fresh fish for dinner. 
watching the sun go down on the Attawapiskat and listening to the mosquitoes doing their blood dance. You want to keep them at ear's length, though. Forget your American Express card up here, but don't leave home without insect repellent. A new day, a new rainstorm, but they don't last long. Maybe the rain would bring good luck to Jason and Zach. Hold it. Do I hear him yelling for us? Oh, that looks like a nice one, Zach. It is. Yeah, oh, that is a nice one. Jeez. Come on, Jason, get ready. Put the net in the water, Jace. The net in the water. Zach will bring the pike back to it. Don't don't extend so oh. far, Jace. Come on. Got it. Oh, Zach. Jeez. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. Outstanding. <laughs> Talk oh, about go, pride. Right the boys' there. pride in that trophy pike and my pride in my boys. Oh, All of us were on cloud nine. Oh, oh, oh you, you have got to be well, thrilled. He hit that and he yeah. said, it's, I got a snag. I, got, I hit it in reverse and he said, no, it's a fish. <laughs> Were you trolling? Yeah. yeah. It's the way you got to, that's the only way these weedless hooks will get set. I know. Let's see that. Yeah. So that, here, take, take my hand here and pull me over. Here. Hand me the net. Oh, Zach, that, that is great. That was a fun fight. Yeah. Well, it must have taken quite a while because you whistled quite a while ago. I said, big. Did you hear me say, oh, big fish? Oh, okay. Oh, look at that. Man. Look at that weedless lure. He, he just sucked it right down there. Now, that is not a huge lure either. No. We're going to have to keep We're keeping this one. Oh, right? we'll keep this one, Zach. You want this one for the wall, don't you? Yep. Yes. No, I don't know about getting this back. You look don't. at Look at the teeth. Look at the teeth. I hope it doesn't decide to chomp down here. Because that, you know, on the, on the top, those are all teeth in there, and these are teeth all around the bottom jaw. And I don't know. I think I can use the dehooker. Okay. Now oh, these gills, I tell you, these gills are every bit as sharp, sharp as, as... Okay, now, go ahead, put the well, spreader... that's a fish there, finally. That is a fish. Good job, Zach, good job. <laughs> he fought for five, okay. five minutes yeah. there. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put the spreaders. Right. Now, these are called pike spreaders, folks. You need them especially for these big pike to hold the mouth open like that. I'm going to take this de-hooker. Uh, can you hold it over here a little bit farther and get it down? On the hook. Look at the size of the teeth. Jeez. Okay. Now I've got it on the hook right there, and lined up with the with the leader. I'll pull the trigger, and with any luck, there it comes right out. The magic bait: a silver daredevil spoon with ripple rind. The fishing camp: Carl Salling's in season adventures. Zach, hold your fish up like you would for the trophy book. Yeah, had a boy. Wow. Harold Bowler Jr. of Saginaw is holding a dogfish. Oh, technically it's called a bowfin, but it weighed almost nine pounds. Hubert Mallory of Mancelona caught this two-pound yellow perch near Northport Bay. Now, if you got your turkey permit application in by today, and you get picked. You may get a 19-pounder with a 10-inch beard like Paul Wenzel's of Utica. Dave Miller of Sandusky tagged this 475-pound 6x6 bull elk in Otsego County. Here's archer Robert Morgan of Swartz Creek with a 15-point buck that had a 26-inch spread. What a buck. What a story. Mike Cook of Hopkins has, uh, you're never going to believe this one, two monster northern pike, a 21 and 3 quarter pounder, and a 25-pound 4-ouncer. Now, it all started on thin ice, so to speak. Well, Mom didn't want me to go out ice fishing because she thought the ice was too thin, so she had to go with me to check it out. So we went out there and set two tip-ups out. We were the only two with tip-ups out. They all looked at us like we were crazy. And about 15 minutes later, the flag went up, <clears throat> and we pulled in the smaller one of the two. The smaller one, which is a 21 and 3 quarter pounder. Yep, and it took about five minutes to get that one in, and I was just shocked over that one when the second flag went up. And Mom left in the meantime to go home because she was cold, and <laughs> we pulled in the bigger one of the two. 
and then we packed up and went home. Hey, Mike, I'd take my fish and go home too. Yes, sir, I'd call it a day and make you our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Angler of the Week. Because of an unexpected break in the weather, the DNR did do an elk census late last week. The population estimates say there are 980 elk in the management area. That's 30 more elk than the DNR thought were there. Representative John Pridney's resolution naming Ottaway the sturgeon capital of Michigan has taken effect just in time for the sturgeon spearing season, which began today. Also, Governor Blanchard has signed into law Representative Pridnia's bill to increase sturgeon poaching damages to a mandatory $1,500. Now, prior to the Pridnia bill, sturgeon poachers were more or less slapped on the wrist. 900-acre Wetzel State Park in Macomb County is undergoing some major changes. Campsites and buildings are planned for the area that used to be open totally for hunting. Some hunters are upset. The issue will be decided in March. Deer hunters are responding to the DNR's vital deer mail survey at a record rate. Already 85% have returned the questionnaire. Biologists feel that Safari Club International's donation of a gun for a drawing for those who respond has helped increase the percentage. There's a problem brewing in Oakland County's Milford Township since a local group has asked the township to ban all hunting. Now they say they're concerned with safety. Anyone who knows the township knows it certainly has grown. It's a suburb or bedroom community with a lot of new residents. And for safety's sake, some areas might very well need to be close to certain forms of hunting. But that's where reason seems to come to an end on this issue because there is no need to ban all hunting for the entire township. However, keeping the safe areas open won't appease the local anti-hunting group. In fact, this group doesn't even want to allow bow hunting, which is extremely safe. Now, what to do about it? Well, if you live or you hunt in Milford Township, you can attend a meeting on Monday night at 6.30 p.m. at Milford High School to express your opinion. Now, that's when the local area hunting board will meet to hear public opinion on the issue of hunting safety. Hopefully, enough hunters will be on hand to remind the board that their responsibility is to judge the safety issue alone and not get bogged down in anti-hunting rhetoric. What does the term carnivorian lethargy refer to? It's the scientific name for the winter sleep of bears. Carnivorian lethargy isn't a true hibernation because the body temperature of bears doesn't drop much below normal while they sleep during the coldest part of the winter. The Marvac RV and Camper Show runs through Sunday at Battle Creek. The JCs and Daisy sponsor a shooter's education program on Saturday at Tecumseh. There's a gun show at the Knights of Columbus Hall in Davison on Saturday and Sunday. And also on Saturday and Sunday, catch the sled dog races at Sandy Pines Park near Door. The All-Canada Fishing, Hunting, and Vacation Show runs Monday through Wednesday at the Lansing Center. Our Stroh's Hunting Awards Banquet takes place Saturday, February 24th at Kellogg Center on the MSU campus. The biggest trophies of the 1989 hunting season will be on display, and we'll be taping all of the stories of the big bucks, bulls, and bears bears and turkeys that didn't get away. The best ones we'll use on Michigan Outdoors. Now it's usually an early sellout, so call soon to reserve your tickets. Also, one month later, March 24th, join us for the Stroh's Fishing Awards Banquet at Kellogg Center. Tickets can be reserved by calling Fred Trost Outdoors Club, and there is a discount to club members. Join us March 2nd, 3rd, and 4th for the Central Michigan Sports Show at the Lansing Center. Retired Tiger great Jim Northrup will be there on Friday and Saturday at the In-Season Adventures booth. June 23rd and 24th is the weekend set for the outdoor fair at Houghton Lake. The fair will be the best show ever. We're really looking forward to it. And if you missed a number, call the Michigan Travel Bureau toll free. Well, we're taking a little winter break here with a summer fishing trip in Canada. Now we're going to go over way to the west side of North America to Alaska for our caribou story, part two. The weather had been bad for the past week in southern Alaska. 
Planes were stacked up waiting to take caribou hunters into the backcountry. Our plane would leave tomorrow morning, so John Ford and I rented a car and spent the afternoon driving down the Kenai Peninsula, taking in the sights. Late August is the time the silver salmon move in for their spawning runs, attracting anglers who cast from shore, often catching their limits. Now watch the salmon jump in the background. Some anglers use bait, but many cast or troll spoons. Look at this, two double hooks instead of one treble are a popular Alaskan combination. Can you imagine a more beautiful setting than this for an afternoon of fishing? All kinds of boats troll the bay at Seward. Private boats, charter boats, big ones, small ones. But I'm not sure that the trollers were having any better luck than the shore fishermen. It seemed that everybody was hooking salmon. You know, you often think of the Caribbean when you think of a cruise ship, but southern Alaska caters to cruise ships in the summer. An occasional belch of smoke is just about the only pollution you see in this country, except, of course, that travesty down the coast. The fragile beauty of Seward, nestled amongst the mountains on a saltwater bay, was untouched by that oil spill. And I have to say, Seward at sundown was the most beautiful setting for a community that I've ever seen. We drove along Prince William Sound south of Anchorage as the tide was going out. Now, it just doesn't slide out to the sea. It's a mad rush of water, bucking the wind. At times, the water level drops 30 feet in a matter of hours. Dangerous for swimming and even boating. You can honestly watch the tide go out and come in. It rises and falls so quickly. But the water itself isn't the only hazard. When John and I crossed a ditch across the beach, we found that the sand that was freshly exposed from the ebbing tide was a hazard as well. Standing in one spot, your footing gives way. The wet sand was like quicksand. I really didn't want to see how far I'd sink, so we didn't play with Mother Nature on this one. We saw the delicate beauty of Alaska on the ground, a stark contrast to what we saw from the air. Jagged volcanic peaks interspersed with valleys of open water, floating chunks of ice that broke off the feet of glaciers were sights that well, it made us wonder how or if anyone had ever set foot up here before. Only description we could come up with is awesome, totally awesome. The western slopes of the mountain range mellowed out with vegetation, clouds, and rain, which occurred about every other day in August. Our outfitter, Gary Pogany, flew us in one of his several planes to Osprey Mountain Lodge, west of Anchorage. Now this is our base camp. Most of the hunters will be flown to individual tents in the surrounding area for several days at a time. Flying, by the way, is a necessary part of life in Alaska. Most everyone, it seems, has a pilot's license. It's the most efficient and oftentimes the only way to get around. Gary's a Michigan native, by the way, transplanting his family to Anchorage a few years ago. Two-thirds of all Alaskans weren't born there. With the mud caused by the August rains, Gary keeps his camp clean and dry with the walkways he's built to connect the main lodge with the tents. These tents are where hunters stay while they're at the base camp. This is the main lodge. Wow, where the guides and the pilots and the chef stays. How do you build a lodge like this in a remote mountain valley? We'll show you in a minute. But this lodge is a dream house for most sportsmen. It's where the meals are prepared and where hunters lounge in comfort. Last summer, Gary added indoor plumbing, a shower, and a sauna. What a view from the living room. For two days, a grizzly bear and her two cubs were feeding on the remains of a butchered caribou. They could be watched through these windows. This bulldozer was flown to a landing strip 20 miles away one summer. It took Gary three winters to drive it the 20 miles to this location over the mountains and through the tundra. With the dozer, the paths are kept graded, and most importantly, the landing strip is constantly groomed to keep it safe for the larger planes. 
Osprey Mountain Lodge, if you're looking at a, a map of Alaska, is 175 miles west of Anchorage and just east of Stony River. That's in a small valley surrounded by mountains and caribou. But now back to the question on building the lodge. It was all done with the help of a portable sawmill that was also flown in. All the logs came from trees in the area, dragged to camp with the bulldozer, and fashioned into planks and two-by-fours on the spot. Quite an undertaking, isn't it? Don't quit your job and move to Alaska with visions of getting rich by opening a hunting camp unless you're a pilot, you have a couple planes, you can build lodges from scratch, and you don't mind risking your money and at times your life to make your dream come true. That's how it's done, the pioneer spirit. An hour after we arrived, John took the camera for a walk around camp with Bobby Canope of In Season Adventures and Bob's nephew Mark on his first Alaskan caribou hunt. Bobby books hunting and fishing trips all over the world and he knows where to look for the big ones. This isn't a big one, it's a small bull caribou, but the first one spotted is always exciting. Look at that bouncing gait. That's how they trot over the tundra. Here he turns and looks towards us. Their eyesight isn't all that good if you hold still, and they often can't resist coming closer to see if, well, you're maybe another caribou. Mark's not going to shoot. He's just using his rifle scope to get a better look. Now, we're going to see lots of caribou in the days ahead. John and I will spend the next few days in the mountains. The Piper Cub dropped us off on a mountaintop, and that's where we'll be next week. I hope you'll join us. Jim Finch sent us a recipe for venison chili, which is just a little bit different than some of the chili recipes that we've done before. And here we've got venison burger, and you can see that it's been processed by a processor because it's got the little pieces of fat in it. And then, of course, we've got our regular chili ingredients. You've got onions and celery and diced garlic and olive oil to fry everything. And olive oil does give it a different flavor. Every olive oil has its own flavor anyway. And then you just want to cook those a little bit. Now, I didn't cook these as, I didn't saute them all the way through. I just let it cook to the point of where they were warmed through pretty good. And then went ahead and added the meat because they are going to cook while the meat is cooking also. And then you want to brown your meat um, pretty good and then add tomatoes and broth. And this is going to make the sauce for it. And then tomato paste, and this will thicken it up pretty good and give it that really good chili consistency. And you want to mix this thoroughly, and right there the aroma starts going through the whole house. And then you're going to add cumin, which is kind of a hot pepper type spice, and chili powder and cayenne pepper. And both of these are quite hot, so you want to use them sparingly because also in the chili powder is some cayenne, a little bit of oregano, and a little bit of allspice. And it, these just blend very, very well with each other. You want to just mix it up and let it cook. Now these are not just your regular kidney beans, it's your Mexican beans, and it, they also have just a little bit of zing to them. And they've got a different consistency too. They're a little bit thicker than the regular kidney beans. And as we all know, Bob Garner has strong opinions about chili. It just meets the two criteria for a perfect chili. There's lots, lots of meat, it's good and thick, and the other thing is it has a little zip to it. You know? It does. It, it sneaks up on you. you. I don't think you taste it at first, but then it... Yeah, but it's not to be confused with, with your romping, stomping, oh, no. you know, chili this, like that. Is this does not burn the first layer of skin no, off no. your mouth. This, <laughs> no, it doesn't. It's a very, very pleasant tasting chili. It makes the venison taste good. It adds a little mm -hmm. zip to it too. It's, it, it, it's what is it that's different about it? I think the allspice that you don't find in most mm. chilies. It, it just it, a little bit different. It does. Fred, Fred, some recipes are something I would add or take away or do do whatever to make it better. Not this one. This one's perfect. <laughs> this one's perfect the way it is. It is. Is that the first time he's ever said that? Um, that perfect on recipe a, on a chili. <laughs> Maybe this is the first best chili recipe. He's had. No, I tell my wife her cooking is perfect all the time. <laughs> Not only is this recipe delicious, it's easy to prepare like all our recipes in the January-February issue of the Outdoor Digest magazine. Folks, the Digest is getting better and better. Just Quick look at our guide report shows that the deer winter severity index in the Upper Peninsula is a little ahead of last year, 50 compared to 38 on the eastern end of the UP, 44 compared to 36 on the west end. 
Although it's still too early to tell, we really won't know how the deer are going to be affected until March. The snow depths that the deer are dealing with, well, up to 30 inches in the western end of the UP. Plenty for winter sports throughout the northern part of the state. We lose the snow in the southern part of the lower peninsula, though. As far as ice conditions go, well, we do have some open water in Saginaw Bay. Makes it dangerous for fishing there. But throughout most of the rest of the northern part of the state, average depth appears to be about uh, 20 inches of our ice thickness. As far as fishing goes in the UP, now uh, they're getting walleye, pike, a couple here and there, perch, seven to nine inches. There's no real bright spots on the fishing scene, except Emil Dean reports a fresh run of steelhead. He gets three to four per trip, up to 10 pounds. Uh, but there's some good fishing around. I hope you can get outdoors this weekend. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Major funding for this program was provided by Stroh. By joining together as partners to preserve our natural treasures, together we ensure our right to enjoy them. Stroh, partners in preserving America's outdoor heritage. You want this one for the wall, don't you? Yep. Yes. No, I don't know about getting this back. Look at look at the teeth. Look at the teeth. I hope it doesn't decide to chomp down here. Because that, you know, on the on the top, those are all teeth in there, and these are teeth all around the bottom jaw. And I don't know. I think I can use the dehooker. Okay. Now oh, these gills, I tell you, these gills are every bit as sharp, sharp as. Okay, now. Go ahead, put the well, spreader. That's a fish there, finally. That is a fish. Good job, Zach. Good job. <laughs>